Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this panel, um, which is called uh, Decarbonizing the UK Economy Towards Net Zero. Um, it's the final day of the City UK's national conference, and our theme today is revitalizing. So we'll have a, have a forward looking discussion about technology innovations and sustainability. Um, I'm Tessa Walsh, and I'm the Green and ESG Financing Editor at IFR for Refinitiv. And I have an expert panel for you today and that I'd like to introduce. We have um, Trevor Allen, who's a sustainability research analyst at BNP Paribas. We have Hani Kablawi, who's chairman of International at Bank of New York Mellon. And we have Dr. Nina Seeger, a research director at the Center for Sustainable Finance at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership. So um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start, I would like to say um, that we have two audience panel questions. They'll show up on your screen, so please choose an answer from multiple choice and um, look forward to hearing the results of those. And before we start, I'd also like to say many thanks to our platinum sponsor BNP and our gold um, sponsor Yorkshire Building Society, DLA Piper and Bank of New York Mellon as well. So without um, much ado, I'd, I'd like to get started. Um, the UK is very firmly in focus after um, the Green Horizon event last week and the Prime Minister's 10-point plan. And there is a lot to say about all of our recent developments. So looking forward to hear from our panelists and what they think. So maybe to kick off, we could have a couple of introductory remarks from everybody and then we'll get to some questions. So. Um, Trevor, how, how are you feeling about uh, recent developments? Well, I, I think it's quite interesting. Each year we kind of move into a more urgent matter in fighting climate change and fighting that, mitigating that risk in that sense. Um, I'm actually relatively optimistic now, more than I was before. I've been involved in ESG and sustainable finance since 2013. And believe me, back then, no one wanted to have a conference like this. So I'm quite encouraged uh, by a lot of the innovations that we see in terms of technology, the, the lower cost of renewable energy that we see that's making a lot of these transitions more competitive in that sense. And what we're really seeing now is the development of economic arguments and financial arguments to really kind of push this, this transition. And for me, that is the key to really the catalyst that's going to really accelerate this transition now. And that is what makes me optimistic about this. Now, I also come from a bank that obviously we're part of the principles for res responsible banking. But one of the interesting comments our CEO made was that a bank has to be conscious of the community that it fits itself into. And when he, he said that um, during an interview, but I, I thought that was very much speaking to us at the bank. And that's really how we've kind of taken that approach to in integrate sustainable finance throughout all our different products. So we can actually help our clients identify where they can make an impact and actually make a return as well. And that's really the, um, the synthesis that we see now going forward into uh, the next decade. And that's what we uh, hope to uh, you know, really propel us to, uh, to that low carbon transition. So thank you, Tessa. Thanks. And Hani, um, how, how are you considering um, sustainability in the wider context of ESG, considering that previously we've had a bit of a tighter focus on green finance? Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, Tessa. And I think we're equally optimistic for all the reasons Trevor um, mentioned. I think um, sustainability has uh, increasingly taken a, a broader definition, and I think we need to help it to take a broader definition. Green finance is um, is definitely at the heart of it, but increasingly, with um, you know, COVID has highlighted, and I think just broadly, the industry is seeing uh, a greater focus on um, social issues and on governance issues, and the interconnectedness between social governance and um uh and sustainable finance i think is, is is playing an important role here um so um you know that that interconnectedness between environmental uh, sustainability social sustainability and economic sustainability i think will define how the industry continues to look at esg uh over the next few years excellent thank you honey and nina what are your thoughts Thank you very much, Tessa. 
Um, if I start a little bit by telling you um, about, I think, two very relevant uh, pieces of work that we've done at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. And I think they chime really well to the recent uh, announcement, especially to the 10-point plan, because within the plan, finance was very much um, fulfilling its function as the key sector underpinning the transformation of the economy. And given the fact that I think the main financial announcements were done during the Green Horizon Summit, whereas the plan was much more about how do we transform the economy as a whole. And we very much see finance within that perspective. So within our rewiring the economy piece of work, we look at finance as having three key tasks. Number one, um, as for its ability to price capital according to the actual cost of doing business. And that very much includes incorporating all sorts of environmental and social source of risk. And just coming back to what Honey was saying, not only climate, but nature, but social type of issues. The second task is ensuring that capital acts for the long term. And that's very much on the opportunity side. So looking how can finance support the delivery of the sustainable development goals. And the third one is, of course, innovating financial structures. And that, I feel, answers the key problem that we've got right now is actually how do we deliver finance towards projects? Because I think there is there is there there may be an issue with some of these more sustainable projects are smaller or located in more emerging markets, which makes them a little bit more difficult to access for major uh, financial institutions. And I think we can maybe talk about it a little bit more later, but another key issue is how do we use the banking sector to actually finance net zero? And we did a key piece of work on that um, with some thinking around what type of product do we need to be putting out? What kind of sector should we be going? It's, it's now about, you know, we need to be going beyond just looking at renewables or just putting in exclusion power, uh, policies, but looking at things of how do we transition the hard to abate sector? How do we reduce financed emissions of our whole portfolios? How do we actually look at financing sustainable agricultural practices that work both on the climate side and on the nature positive side? So I think there is a lot of thinking that's going on that connects those themes. Excellent. So from a, from a broad perspective, um, and we'll get into some of those topics a little later, but um, just broadly to start with, um, so how can we ensure that these concepts are integrated into our post-pandemic era of economic rebuilding? How can we ensure that this is part of our green recovery um, in the UK specifically? Um, Trevor, do you want to kick off with that? Sure. So I, I think a good place to start actually is with green bonds in that sense. And the reason is because that does provide transparency, but it also provides the external audit part to actually understand the eligibility of projects to make sure that the selection process was appropriate, but also to make sure that when we're looking at the, uh, what these green projects are, there's additionality there. They're adding something more to what would have been developed otherwise in that sense. And that can kind of really set us on a true transitional path in that sense. So I, I always come back to the keys being transparency and then actual measurement after that. So how do you actually go through and measure what is the difference you've made by investing in this green technology there? Now, the positive news about this, as I said, is we, we actually have economies of scale now. So when we look at a green for renewable energy, economies of scale for renewable energy. So when we look at issuing a green bond, really for the next decade, Renewable energy is kind of the low hanging fruit in terms of that transition. And that's kind of what uh, Nina was saying there. There's no argument about this anymore. It's the financial beneficial energy to actually invest in. So you can demonstrate that you're actually going to get a return uh, for your investors. And in, in the case of a green bond, actually for your, um, your taxpayers as well, which is incredibly powerful, but it, it also moves the needle incredibly well for actually reducing emissions. And at the end of the day, that is the key. So I, I agree, there are many different waves on this. It's important to invest in the innovations, but it's also important to invest in the technology that's ready today, that's actually going to have the biggest impact on reducing emissions. And I'll, I'll pause there for our other panelists to uh, contribute as well. Maybe building on that a little bit, I think um, it's, it's, it's known that the market is struggling with the lack of ESG data availability, comparability, 
and quality and uh, and policymakers can help facilitate the creation of publicly accessible data platforms where ESG corporate data can be maintained. We certainly welcome the EU stated plans to create an ESG data platform to give investors um, access to financial and sustainability corporate information in, in one place. And we've supported the need for the ESG data platform in our response to the European Commission consultation on the renewed sustainable finance strategy in July. And we would hope that the UK follows the same approach. And maybe another point here is, is the point around global policy alignment being really critical. Um, climate crisis and financial markets are global. And so any local policy efforts, um, including in the UK, will need to be scaled up at, and, at international levels. Um, and it's, it's great that the UK government explicitly stated its commitment to at least matching the ambition of the, and, you know, the objectives of the EU action plan on sustainable finance um, with respect to green, green finance, uh, irrespective of the outcome of, of Brexit. Um, and, uh, and it's great to have heard the UK Chancellor um, uh, speak about that. And I'd say as a global firm, we're in support of implementing the EU regulations, but we would welcome greater regulatory alignment, um, including a focus on global benchmarks where possible across all ESG taxonomies, definitions, and standards. Tessa, could I come in actually on the green recovery plans? Yes, I think um, we, we need to be aware of the fact that when we are planning for the recovery, uh, green recovery plans, according to a number of pieces of analysis, including the one piece that we've done together with the Women Business Coalition and the Cambridge Econometrics, actually mean uh, better recovery. They bring more jobs, substantially more jobs than uh, recovery to the business as usual. We've seen this post the financial crisis with the analysis that took place there. We're seeing it being looking at the scenarios that we're simulating right now. So I don't think the question is whether we go for a green recovery or non-green recoveries. I think the question is how do we tailor that green recovery to have the biggest impact possible both on our transition and on the jobs creation. And do you have any thoughts on how we might be doing that? So effectively, I mean, we've seen some of this come out in the 10 point plan, right? We've seen uh, buildings, we've seen um, retrofitting buildings in there. We've seen some of, the, some of that thinking coming through. Um, we also, I think, need to start thinking about how do financial institutions work with their clients to transition their clients. And I know that there's already a number of financial institutions that have made particular commitments to driving down the emissions on their portfolios. Um, so I think it's a question of, number one, having particular plans in place that allow you to, um, to have a more sustainable future. But on the other hand, involving the financial system in its core function of providing capital and being an intermediary that sits in between the clients and capital and helping the clients transition, bringing experts in, having a more collaborative approach. And that's one of the things that we've come to when we were discussing the idea of Bank 2030, how does the banking system transition towards a net zero world? Thank you. So um, in terms of um, coming back to Trevor's point about instruments and, and green bonds, um, how can sustainable finance in particular help us to meet that target. We've seen a rapidly um, developing array of instruments. So I'm wondering if you, Trevor, you could just run through some of the innovations that we've seen and then we'll move on to some other topics and um, very interested in what you're both seeing at your respective institutions on that front. So Trevor, can you kick off? Absolutely, thank you, Tessa. I, I, I think what's interesting is that we're actually seeing sustainable finance permeate traditional financial instruments that we have in, have in place today, I think what really needs to change is, is the thinking. So when we, disc, when we uh, construct a basket of, or a portfolio of securities, um, what we're thinking about not necessarily is there's a component of reducing emissions and there's a component of saving the world, but now there's an additional component of actually having a financial argument. So when we look at a lot of these, we think about the fourth industrial revolution. 
And by saying that, what we're, we're actually thinking about here is what are the elements that's going to make a successful company in the fourth industrial revolution? Well, we know digitalization, AI are going to be a key part of that, but we're also seeing things like the circular economy. We're seeing other elements uh, such as renewable energy, uh, low carbon uh, technologies in that sense, carbon capture storage. These are energy efficiency. These are all elements that will profit in that area and therefore make good components to actually go into some of these instruments. And I think that's really the key is you, you need to understand what are, you, what, what are you actually trying to do? So the instruments are there to help you, but if you don't design the components of those instruments in a way that's actually forward thinking to how the economy is going to develop, the instruments really are not gonna be effective. So green bonds are great because they have, they have the, the transparency. Sustainability linked bonds are fantastic because they have the KPIs in there that actually give the company the, the flexibility to spend the capital how they need to to develop their uh, business further, but constricts them to actually achieving a particular target in that sense. And then off the back of that, um, obviously you have the, uh, the equity portfolios, but I would just caution on the equity portfolios, we always take a very thematic approach. So it goes back to what is actually going into these portfolios that's going to make that change. You don't always want to be kind of a generalist when you're looking at these topics because not all of the ingredients that go into these uh, instruments are going to be the, the same in that sense. So I would just uh, caution on that when people are looking at these instruments, what is what are really the underlying factors? And I'll, I'll pause there for uh, Hani as well. Yeah, Hani, what are you seeing in your, as you, uh, as you have those conversations and um, um, the industry innovation that we're looking for? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Tessa, and thank you, Trevor. So, um, so we help clients uh, issue securities, uh, including green bonds through our corporate trust capabilities. We help them manage um, port investment portfolios, um, including ESG strategies. And um, we help with data and analytics. And maybe the focus from an innovation and digital and data perspective is in data and analytics, uh, understanding that data challenges are at the core of um, enhancing the industry's approach to sustainable finance. We've focused on integrating ESG data across um, investment, the investment chain for the benefit of, of, of clients. And, and it's really in response to a few unmet needs from a data perspective. There is no global standard on really what sustainability is. Investors align to their own purposes and values. And I think that's a great thing, right? One um, investor will want to invest uh, in uh, themes that are uh, around plastics in the ocean. Another is um, um, concerned about child labor and, and so on and so forth. And so we're, we're supporting customization of ESG expectation agnostic of data sources. Uh, effectively, clients bring their own benchmarks and choose their own factors. And through then crowdsourcing, we're able to generate uh, a, uh, a set of um, crowdsourced benchmarks that clients can then benchmark themselves against what is developing in the industry as a, as a benchmark. And that'll be useful for as long as you know, standards aren't um, uh, created and set. So a crowdsourced approach hopefully helps um, investors benchmark themselves. And then there's also a mislabeling green and social washing concern on how portfolio managers, you know, can create more transparency in, in, in that sense. So we're, we, we try to give demonstrability screens against ESG objectives in investment portfolios, uh, effectively allowing investors to uh, veto or give feedback on vendor provided um, data quality and, uh, and, 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 and giving them an opportunity to, to challenge the quality of data so that it can constantly get improved and you know, for the benefit of, of the entire industry. Thanks, Hani. Um, Nina, what are you seeing as uh, some of the key innovations? Well, there's, there's a number, but I just wanted to come back to what Hani was saying. I think there are standards coming. I think the British Standards Institute are, is putting out a number of standards that will make that process easier. 
but I do agree that we need much more cohesion in what we see in the marketplace because there's a number of very disparate initiatives. And it's and if you are a financial institution, uh, which is global and has branches in a number of countries, it's very hard being you know complying with every single one of them. So the more cohesion we can have as a global marketplace, I think the fundamentally better it is. Thank you. Um, just wanted to come back to Hanley and um, just to, to ask for a little bit more detail around some of the interesting things that you were saying. Um, where do you see the most demand for data in the work that you're doing? And where do you think that uh, attention may need to focus to remove some of the roadblocks? Um, I think, Tessa, it's, it is about um, the fact that whether it's a chief risk officer, chief investment officer, or chief distribution officer looking for better quality data and looking to benchmark themselves against others, both for investment return purposes, uh, which is which has been playing out over you know many years, but also increasingly for um, green investment purposes, sustainable investment purposes, and and the the demand that we're seeing, and I think the demand will just continue to increase here. Is, is exactly on that. It's around data quality and it's around the availability of data that is relevant and impactful to them individually until the standards are developed and, 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 and the industry just moves towards a single set of standards. And there's, you know, to Nina's point, there's plenty of movement in that direction, but it'll take many years. And, uh, you know, I can tell you from a, from a, um, a senior manager perspective, an SMF perspective, uh, we are having to comply and integrate ESG in one way, shape, and form in our UK bank uh, and in a different way in our European bank. And, you know, we've, volu we've voluntarily signed up to TCFD at a global level for our US bank. And, and so there's a, there's a convergence, but the convergence is slow and couldn't come soon enough. Thanks very much. So um, I just want to ask maybe um, Trevor and Hani, and I'd very much in, also interested in your thoughts, Nina. Um, when you're engaging with your clients on transition, um, what are the sort of practical discussions that you're having? How are those discussions materializing? And are there any common themes or trends that you can, or takeaways that you can um, discuss with those at, at quite a high level, perhaps? Trevor, do you want to go with that question? Sure, thank you, Tessa. So yes, when we're talking to our clients, the first thing is to understand, the, the interesting thing about sustainable finance is before finance was very quantitative, you know, it, it was data driven, not that that's changed necessarily with sustainable finance, but people also have personal ambitions, personal emotions that they bring with them to sustainable finance from their own world. So it's a bit of a different conversation than what you were standard conversation would just be a kind of about a bland swap or something like that, or an FX uh, conversion. People, uh, they, they want more out of their capital in that sense. So really it's understanding what are the elements that they want to try and have an impact on. Or are they looking at this from a regulatory viewpoint where they think there's going to be increased regulation on certain industries? Are they looking at this as they want to understand how they can actually use their capital to help remove some of the plastics in the ocean that we were talking about? Are they looking at this, um, as I was saying before, as kind of like that fourth industrial revolution? What do we see out on the horizon in the future and how are companies adapting their business activities to that in that sense? So um, I think you get a much closer relationship with your clients because you have a better idea of what they're trying to actually accomplish with their capital. Uh, because of that, though, you often end up in areas where they want a product that's a bit more customizable to them. So what I see a lot of times is when we're developing products, uh, we develop products that have very specific metrics that can under that can demonstrate how much re uh, emissions we're reducing from a portfolio, how much green uh, energy we're actually increasing in a portfolio um, across uh, across the spectrum. Uh, but we also make the portfolios very flexible. So if they want to go into certain sectors or if they want to go into certain regions, or if, as I was saying before, they want to focus on you know, a water conservation, for example, we need to be able to kind of tailor these investments very quickly and very specific to how they want to actually make their impact. So um, I'll pause there though, but thank you. Um, 
Hani, what kind of discussions are you having with your clients, if you can share with us at a very high level? Um, yeah, maybe picking up on a couple of things that we've um, we, we've uh, we've all discussed here. Um, we do we do appreciate regulatory alignment and the pacing of um, the regulatory alignment is going to be important um, as it pertains to implementing ESG disclosure regulations globally. The, the market isn't necessarily equipped to properly address the, you know, in, in limited timeframes, um, given the evolutionary state of ESG data analytics and the lack of consistency in the market when it comes to interpreting ESG risks currently. So for products, for example, and you know, uh, Trevor mentioned uh, foreign exchange, securities, finance, derivatives, there's no clear criteria yet to identify equivalent collateral when, a, for example, an asset owner is applying an ESG investment strategy or lending out ESG compatible stocks. Um, and there's no common understanding in the market on fungibility of assets for ESG purposes. So we risk seeing some asset owners pulling out of some of this activity and that has liquidity impacts potentially, which actually flies in the face of, you know, the capital markets union, um, uh, uh, UMR regulations, collateral optimization, velocity of collateral, all of these are critical and the capital markets union is trying to encourage um, the, the, you know, liquidity and, and the fungibility of collateral. So I think to regulators here, we'd say, it's important to avoid, avoid blunt approaches and work with industry to develop strategic transition approaches to protect the liquidity in the market, recognizing the fact that securities lending, for example, is vital to deep and well-functioning markets. And I could go on here. There's a, you know, it's important that we concern ourselves with the E, the S, and the G. I think that development of harmonized global best practice standards are important for the climate agenda. Um, but it needs to be tackled outside of national regulatory barriers. And I think there's you know, clarity on how the market should, should address non-ESG or brown assets. Simply screening out these assets could lead to stranded assets and corporate failures. So maybe there's a, a need to define a clear incentivization structure for green assets, uh, but at the same time, define a pathway to disincentivize brown assets over time. These are some of the conversations that we have with our clients and they're definitely impacting our advocacy agenda as well, Tessa. If I Thank come you. in very Please. briefly, um, I think it's it's almost beyond um, the financial system creating stranded assets. We're gonna end up with stranded assets anyway. So there was a piece of work that we did um, with uh, researchers at um, Open University and at Exeter that quantified the amount of stranded assets in the system right now in the absence of any new incoming climate policy. And we're looking at somewhere between six and $12 trillion as we speak. And uh, we'll update that number and we'll release those um, uh, numbers in about a, a month time. Having said that, I think we, managed transition is important. And the question right now is not how, it's not whether we will transition, but how we will transition, right? And the earlier we start a very structured process of transition that thinks about how do we transition the hard to abate sectors? I mean, when we're having, if we come back to your original question, Tessa, around the client conversations, the, uh, the conversations which are of most importance are with clients in hard to transition sectors. So how do we move them along? How do we put them onto the path to sustainability? So from that perspective, I think the, the role of the financial sector is key. And it's not only on the regulatory, uh, on the regulators to move uh, the economy, but it's a lot of this actually sits on the financial institution's shoulders in how do we help the clients transition and get us to a sustainable world and avoid a sudden abrupt transition, which is triggered by elements which are outside of our control. Absolutely. Um, we've seen some very interesting transactions this week that are uh, linking to science-based targets, which is um, all interesting developments in as um, from hard to, harder to abate sectors. Um, wondering if I can just briefly um, ask you all to comment on the results of our first poll, which are actually really quite interesting. 
So um, as part of the um, Green Horizons um, event last week and the announcement of the Green Guild, we also announced that the UK is going to be looking at its own taxonomy. So that's what our poll, first poll question was about. And it asked to what extent the UK should be aligning with the EU regulatory framework on sustainable finance, including the taxonomy and disclosure regulations. So, so the results suggested that 27% think that uh, full alignment with the EU is preferable. Um, can, can be a bit tricky. 73% um, think that alignment with high level principles and definitions is appropriate, but it needs to be adopted to a different implementing framework. And then 0% think that the UK should not align and develop its own approach. So I'm wondering if we could just uh, comment on those interesting findings briefly. Uh, Trevor, would you like to kick off? So I, I think that's a very encouraging poll, first off, because we've had 0% saying that we don't want to adopt these targets. Um, look, full disclosure, BNP Paribas sat on the tag that helped to actually define uh, the EU taxonomy in that sense. So we're obviously a fan. It's very, something very close to our heart. For me, this is, this is the Rosetta Stone that's going to help us to actually translate from climate goals to actual financial action in that sense. And these can be very demonstrable and they're very transparent and they're highly measurable. And you know, we, we keep hearing this, I hear this phrase mentioned over and over again this year, and I just want to uh, kind of give the credit where it's due. Peter Drucker is the one that all told us, you can't me if you can't measure it, you can't make it, you can't change it in that sense. Sorry, I summarized it, but um, you understand the point there that it's key that we actually memorize, the, that we uh, measure these components to understand where companies are on their transition. To Nina's point, going into the hard to abate sectors, they cannot necessarily pivot. So we, we need to provide them with a pathway and we need to provide them with a way that they can actually over time incrementally reduce their emissions so they can pivot to a new technology, a new way of actually conducting their business activity. In order to do that, though, we need these milestones that are going to actually show us the, how to measure that. And the EU taxonomy, just to give you one key point, up until 2025, an automobile will be considered EU taxonomy eligible if it produces 50 grams of carbon per kilometer driven or less. That's basically your Toyota hybrid or EV. After 2025, it's gonna be zero. So the taxonomy is also a living document. So as we get better, as we start to reduce our emissions, the taxonomy is gonna to get tougher and it's going to continue to kind of provide that catalyst to, for further change. And I'll pause there, thank you. Thanks, Hani. I know you've got um, very, interesting views on the respective taxonomies. So please, uh, would you like to share? Well, and we sit on um, uh, a couple of the uh, GFMA uh, work groups here. Um, there's a draft GFMA report coming out soon. And 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 one of the things it, it's saying um, off the back of, I think, broad alignment uh, in that working group is that common global definitions of climate finance and consistent principles for taxonomies and well-defined sector and region specific taxonomies are really important um, and foundational elements to, to create um, more manageable transaction costs and, um, uh, and a reasonable uh, approach to transition and more broadly a, a, a sense of, um, I guess, uh, uh, development, positive momentum in climate finance more broadly. Um, so we think regulation should be globally harmonized and aligned with the pace of climate finance market developments, um, broadly speaking. And I think that uh, the, the GFMA report will be um, will be out shortly, um, uh, calling for for um, for all of that. Thank you. I, I guess the, the aim is to create less work rather than more. Um, Nina, what are your thoughts on, on that? Fully the, subscribe the task to, is urgent. <laughs> well, I fully subscribe to your notion of creating less work rather than more, given especially how much work we've got anyway, to ensure that transition takes place in a sustainable and a managed manner. Um, I think there is, uh, I think, it's not just that we'd be looking to follow uh, the European regulations. I think there's a lot of space for us to lead and to lead in a cohesive and a collaborative way. So one example, again, is the British Standards Institute putting out standards, but then collaborating across the ISO to ensure that those standards actually become a global standard. I think I 
I tend to agree that we need a coherent um, set of regulations that will will allow the uh, European countries to uh, move all in lockstep along with the other global counterparties. So how um, how could the just just want to follow on from that? How could the UK um, how could the UK lead in this respect? Do you feel that to me to everybody? Yes, uh, to you, Nina. Yeah, just so, following on from what you said. Sure. Let's think about what have we announced? We've announced guilds, which is a fantastic step. However, we're not the first sovereign to announce a green sovereign issue. Where we are quite good at is bringing TCFD, uh, making TCFD more mandatory. Mm -hmm. I think the timeline on on that is uh, um, getting quicker and quicker, which is brilliant. I think the fact that we have climate stress tests coming in next year is absolutely fantastic. And arguably, if we actually look at the leading geographies in understanding how climate fits into financial regulation, Britain, France, and the Netherlands are probably the three leading geographies within that space. So I think, you know, if we continue innovating in that, if we uh, continue looking at how not, but not only climate, let's, let's step wider, let's look at the wider environmental picture, let's start thinking about nature, how does nature fit into regulation. Um, so I think there is a number of ways in which we can continue leading the field. Thank you very much. So um, in terms of uh, in terms of how the if we wind up with multiple taxonomies, how they might work, do you all have uh, thoughts on how they could work together? Um, who went, Trevor, would you, why don't you kick off with that and then I'll ask everybody. So first off, I, I absolutely think we're going to end up with different taxonomies. We know today that China, Japan, uh, Canada are all looking at uh, separate taxonomies. I think India started as well. So it's, it's a question of when in that sense. I, I think what you need to do in these situations is understand where the technology is at and where the inflection points are for the pricing. Um, it's one thing to sit there and say that you know a heavy emitting industry should decarbonize now. If it doesn't have the pivot point, how do you kind of you know how do you how do you get it to that pivot point? So one of the keys, you know, COP twenty six, uh, what we keep hearing over and over again, um, the uniformity of how we measure our pathway to a, a, a carbon neutral society is going to be critical. And agreeing those units, those frequencies, and those areas are going to be key to develop developing an understanding of who the laggards are. But also we need to understand that the economic levels are going to be different for companies to actually um, assist in their transition. So we need to go back and revisit the funding that we uh, were talking about in in previous COPs around uh, the island nations and the nations that need more help in those actual transitions. So the key for a lot of the developed economies is going to be to invest in this technology at their taxonomy level that then can kind of disperse down to other countries in that sense. Um, The benefit of that is we do have a lot of the leading um, academic institutions that are going to be able to guide us on this. So I think it's incumbent upon major nations to actually rely on their academic uh, experts, on the scientists, to actually help to show what the level of um, climate change we need in terms of emissions reduction and to work with industry to actually see how they can get there. Uh, The key part there is that transparency around how we actually measure this data and kind of just going back to the UK again, we we often look at the UK as a center of excellence in terms of uh, legal, uh, in terms of law and how the, um, um, that resonates uh, through contracts throughout the world in that sense. The UK does have a role to play here in kind of the harmonization of that data and also the agreement along how different countries could actually come together to uh, show how their data can help uh, fit together so we we don't necessarily have these disparities. I think you're naturally going to have disparities around certain countries that rely on certain elements of the economy to really drive their GDP. Those are gonna be the areas that we would expect to see countries address first, otherwise they could risk turning into a laggard there. So this all boils down to kind of the trade impacts then. So I think what we're going to see is one of the mitigating aspects around this is going to be trade is how you actually resolve some of these differences through the taxonomy 
And that's going to be incumbent upon the, the actual legal framework that you use to help resolve these. So um, OECD, um, you know, different elements like that are going to be key to actually kind of um, bring a harmonization to these different standards. And I'll pause there. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Hani, how do you feel about operating multiple taxonomies? I think um, Trevor makes a very good point that I, I, I worry about um, arbitrage and um, you know there is a um, uh, there's a, a significant part of, of financing that is done by non-financial um, organizations or non-banks um, in different regions and so to the extent that there's an, an opening uh, for um, you know arbitrage uh, regulatory arbitrage taxonomy type arbitrage I think there there's a risk there that needs to be mitigated if we end up with um, differing taxonomies in different regions. Uh, Nina, thoughts there? Just very quickly, I think we also need to recognize that we cannot transition the UK alone. However good we are, however good UK and the European Union are, we're going to need to transition the world as a whole. And that effectively means actually having differentiated set of standards for those who can do more and those who actually have bigger problems in terms of just transition, bigger challenges to scale in terms of physical impacts, bigger, bigger emerging market type challenges. So I, I think in all actuality, um, even if we end up with differentiated type of taxonomies, we're going to have to uh, be more stricter within our, I think, within our geography so that we can lead, so we can actually enable the world as a whole to stop at one and a half degree. Thanks, Nina. And uh, I'm aware that time's um, running short, so just a quick question and then maybe we'll just do some closing thoughts. But um, just to quickly touch on the last poll, I've um, got some results now. Um, the comment current barriers to integrating ESG into decision making and strategy from investors point of view. Um, we have 36% citing a knowledge gap, 29% citing lack of data, 7% saying leadership buy in, uh, nobody saying time horizon and um, uh, the lack of evidence on returns and performance is 29%. Now we discussed this uh, slightly earlier. Nina, I know you've got a strong, strong uh, views on the last category, but maybe we could just discuss that briefly. So Would if I like can, oh, with, with pleasure, I was um, part of my kind of my reaction was when I saw the results come in. Um, we do not have lack of evidence or scientific evidence. That is not a category that is available. Therefore, I suspect you can sum up that last category with the first one, which cites a knowledge gap. I will give you both academic and practitioner evidence. In terms of academic evidence, a couple of years ago, Tim of Academics had done a meta study, which means they summarized 2,200 other studies on the relationship between ESG and performance and found that 90% of those studies found a non-negative correlation. And in most cases, it was a positive correlation. Therefore, academically, it's not a question to be discussed whether ESG does not mean better performance. The second, which is the practitioner evidence. We have seen um, COVID crisis giving us a very last minute detail on the fact that sustainable companies have performed better through the corona crisis than unsustainable companies. We've seen BlackRock analysis that said that sustainable indices have outperformed their mainstream indices. And there are a number of reasons for that. Some of it is around their composition because they tend to be towards pharma and tech. Some of them is around the fact that there was a flow of funds into sustainable products during the crisis and an outflow from the mainstream ones. But a major huge part of it is the fact that sustainable companies understand their supply chains, understand their governance, have a much better understanding at the board level of how they interact with all of those counterparties. Uh, and that was a deciding factor in actually coming through the corona crisis better than if you don't really know where your products are coming from, who you're trading with, and all of those things. So I'm, I have quite clearly very strong view about the fact that that, that last point is not a reason. Thank you. Um, Trevor, thoughts? 
So that's it's going to be a difficult one to follow there. There's a lot of passion. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. And that's one of the areas that's, you know, being around since 2013, I've had people yelling at me on stage from the, well, people in the audience yelling at me on stage, show me the evidence over and over again. We, we are beyond the evidence point now. Um, if you look at the levelized cost of energy, so that's actually the cost for CapEx and OpEx and actually making a return on solar or onshore wind, it is economically competitive with coal in China, with natural gas or coal in the, U in the EU, it's actually beating it, and it's competitive with natural gas in the US as well. So we, we no longer have these problems, you know, it, it's around the, how you're structuring your investment. It's around understanding these companies and governance is obviously a key to that, but we, you know, we've moved well beyond that. Now we've seen companies that have good social programs have better performance from their employees, better performance from the employees, better results in the, in the end product. We've seen companies that have broken that social contract with their communities, and we've seen them suffer as well. So this is not necessarily a question of actual reputational damage. This is regulatory uh, potential burden upon these companies. This is actual uh, risk in terms of fraud and legal allegations in terms of that. But there's also that alpha generation, and that can be clearly seen on the environmental and the governance and the social sides now. And this is what really makes us exciting to be to be here now and to be able to talk to our clients about this, is we, the, you know, the math is on our side now. For the, five or six years there, that's all anyone wanted to see from me was the math. So we, we, uh, we've done our homework now. Um, you know, I totally agree with you. And uh, thank you all. Paul's there for, uh, for Hani. No, I, I'll, I'll just d triple down, I guess. Um, there's, there's two interesting um, studies that, um, that one can refer to. One is a um, Harvard um, uh, Chan School of Public Health study that found that someone who lives uh, for decade, decades in a country with uh, high levels of fine particle pollution is 8% more likely to die from COVID than someone who lives in a region that has um, uh, much less um, such pollution. And then the other is the Harvard Business Review study by George Serafine that analyzed 3,000 firms between late February and late March. Uh, and the data indicated that during this period, uh, stocks perceived as ESG responsible outperformed their competitors. The, and, and these are just, this is just one study. There are many others that point to the same thing, uh, uh, Tessa. And then the last thing I will say is it, it is also intuitive. Like the studies are there, but it's also intuitive. And I think that's to both Nina's and Trevor's points. Companies that are more responsible, that, that invest today to impact tomorrow, that want to be around for the long term, that are conscious about uh, their social responsibility towards their employees, their clients, their shareholders, and the communities in which they live, work, and serve are likely to perform better over the long term. The studies show it, but it's also um, really, really intuitive. Thanks. Um, okay, so I think time's running a little short, so I should probably um, start to wrap things up a little bit. Um, I'm wondering if we can just maybe conclude with a couple of questions. Um, maybe I'm very interested in what everybody's key takeaway is from the last 10 days, which have been very interesting, specifically in a UK context. And then, and then maybe we might run through some closing thoughts after that. So um, who'd like to kick off? Nina, why don't you kick off? I think the key takeaway is that the 10 point plan is a very viable starting point towards transitioning the UK and the finance is acting as a key part in rewiring the economy. And I think that's effectively uh, in terms of concluding thoughts. I think, you know, we need to start doing we need to uh, talk a little bit less about this kind of stuff and spend a little bit more time actually helping uh, clients transition. And in our perspective, helping financial institutions uh, find whatever data and expertise they need to be able to transition. Thanks very much. Um, Trevor, um, what do you think? And any, any closing thoughts as well? Uh, you know, in terms of the 10 point plan, one of the things that really came across to me is banning diesel and petrol cars by 2030. That's a huge step forward. So what I think we're really seeing from the UK now is they are making a serious commitment to actually changing behavior in the UK, whether that's consumer or corporate behavior. And that is, we haven't necessarily had that level of commitment before. On the back of that, you have the green guilt that's going to come out and the transparency around that that's going to really offer up 
um, a deeper insight into the actual plans for the UK. Off the back of all of this, we can now structure investments which are going to have a catalyst to actually accelerate this transition on top of it. So the more transparency, the more leadership we can have from the UK government, the better the financial institutions can support them in this transition and uh, support the, the rest of the, the world as well in doing that. So I'll pause there, but thank you. Honey? Uh, the only thing I'll add is, is we would double down on, on, on global harmonization. Um, uh, we would like to uh, implement uh, and help clients implement their transitions in a way that is aligned across borders and across industries. Okay, well, um, thank you all so much for, for joining me today. It's been really interesting. I, I think there are several things that I might need to go and ask more questions about, but I guess it was ever thus. <laughs> so um, I'd just like to thank you all very much for such an interesting discussion and um, very informative as well. So I guess with that, um, it's time to end the panel, but thank you very much. You've, you've all been brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Myself.